Welcome back. We're about to continue with the um, worksheet 4B, or the Special Relativity Consolidation Worksheet. So far on this worksheet, the other videos have gone through questions 1 through to 6. We're now going to have a look briefly at question 7 and then uh, focus mostly in on question 8. The reason why I had to go briefly look at question seven is that um, this is very similar to a worksheet that you, um, a question that you have done on a previous worksheet. Um, what we want to look at is this graph over here where um, we have momentum on the vertical axis and uh, velocity on the horizontal axis. Uh, this graph here obviously is momentum and momentum as you know is MV. Um, as a result, this is a straight line relationship between momentum equals uh, mass times velocity. So if this is a velocity axis and this is a momentum axis, then um, the gradient is given by this one here. Now we're going to show that uh, formally in a few more moments. Uh, this is the relativistic axis and this of course uses momentum equaling the momentum of a particle at velocity is the gamma factor multiplied by the Newtonian um, uh, the new Newtonian concept of momentum. So in reality, this over here is um, rho naught or p naught. Okay. And um, what really we need to have a look at is up until about this point here, these two graphs are really the same graph. They are coincidental. And this looks all right, if you estimate, it's about 0.4c. Um, which is, you know, four tenths of the speed of light. That's a very fast speed. As a result, um, speeds below this, you wouldn't notice any relativistic change in the momentum. So this formula over here works really well for the majority of cases. 0.4c is very fast. In our daily lives, we wouldn't see things moving at this speed. So Newtonian physics is a good approximation to what we need for our daily lives. However, as we get faster than the speed of, um, to the half wrap at this point here, we start to see it starting to diverge away. Um, and therefore, we really need to take into account uh, relativism uh, of the two physics. So we're going to have to use our gamma factor. So I'm just going to formally show that the gradient of both graphs is mass. So if this is the vertical axis there is momentum and the horizontal axis is velocity and we have that as the graph, then taking a small triangle and now I'm going to use K for the gradient. I know the normal letter is M, but because M in this um, thing is mass, I don't want it to be confusing. So the gradient would equal vertical rise over horizontal run. Now the vertical rise over here is this much here and it's measuring amount of momentum. So that is momentum. And that's a row on the top, okay? Um, the horizontal um, run is velocity. So that amount there would measure amount of velocity. Now, momentum, according to Newtonian physics, is mv and velocity is v. So cancelling, we get the gradient, which I'm using as k, remember, is equal to m, which is mass. So that's formally the mass. The relativistic physics like that has a, the gradient at any point would equal the tangent at that point. And since this is a physics class and not a maths class, the differential of this curve here um, would be the gradient. And you can happily go and um, differentiate with respect to V and find that the gradient um, dP or d rho by dV would have be a function of um, velocity. Okay, sorry, function of mass, I should say. Um, and uh, that would mean that it would simply be that the gradient of both of these is mass. But even more than that, you could just simply extrapolate that this curve here, being the, um, the classical Newtonian physics, is now just simply bent into this shape. And since the gradient of this curve 
the momentum curve is mass, then also we can assume that the gradient of the relativistic momentum curve is also mass. This gives us the idea that mass itself, because the gradient increases um, in the relativistic curve, that as we go uh, further and further up, the gradient of this curve would also increase. And that means that as we go faster and faster, the measured, um, uh, the measured mass of our particle or our object would also increase. So um, that's the first one we found the um, showing that the gradient of both graphs is mass. The second is account for the shape of the relativistic curve. Well, to account for the shape of the relativistic curve, we need to make sure that we identify the main fundamental feature of that curve. Well, there's two fundamental features of that curve. So let's just draw it. The first is that it has a curved shape. And as we approach the value of C, the momentum starts to become um, infinite. Okay, the gradient of the curve becomes infinite as well. Okay, so we're going to account for the shape. Now, the shape will be given because this momentum, uh, sorry, this um, momentum curve is equal to um, gamma times the Newtonian momentum. Now, gamma is 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared on c squared. That means as c here, sorry, as v here approaches c, then the denominator 1 minus v squared on c squared will approach 1 minus 1, which is approaching 0. So the I'm um, going back up here, it's, that gamma is there, and of course it's simply multiplied by um, the natural momentum there. So as we approach c, then this factor here approaches infinite, uh, infinity because 1 divided by infinity, sorry, 1 divided by 0 approaches infinity. So that means that this curve here will um, start to become infinite as um, C, it approaches C. The other feature of the graph that you must mention in this case here is that that means that there is a vertical asymptote here um, that cannot be passed. That means that the maximum speed of light, um, the maximum speed that the object can have is the speed of light. And that is because the gamma factor approaches a zero and, and this V squared on C squared approaches one. And that would give you a division of zero by zero in the denominator. Okay. And finally, the question as to why we still use Newtonian um, concepts of momentum, as I said before, <clears throat> If you notice this graph, it's coincidental. In other words, the two graphs are identical nearly um, for um, speeds less than approximately 0.4 C. Um, and therefore, um, why would you need to go to so much effort to find a gamma factor where um, if you were to do gamma factors for our daily lives, you'd be down here and the gamma factor would nearly be always 1. It would be 1.000, a lot of zeros before um, a number. So our gamma factor is approximately equal to 1 down here. It only starts getting away from 1 up in this area here. Okay. Um, so that's the reason why we simply use a more convenient idea of Newtonian momentum um, uh, for our daily lives. Okay. Let's now look at question eight. Question eight is um, uh, hopping to one of Einstein's thought experiments uh, where we have an observer X in the center of a carriage here on a train and it's traveling um, at uh, 0.95 C or 95% of the speed of light. We also have an observer out here standing on the ground outside the train. And um, as observer X and y, um, passes the observer Y, in other words, when these two become coincidental in um, um, basically in this position here, 
um, X will send a pulse of light to the sensor over here, okay, towards the sensor, okay. So let's go through each of the questions, okay. So number one, well, question A, says to compare the speed of light, um, the light pulse, as measured by both X and Y. Um, well, this is a simple one because X measures the speed of light in their frame of reference as the speed of light, according to the um, first postulate. And Y measures the speed of light in all frames of reference, doesn't matter if it's theirs or anyone else's, as also the speed of light. So they have to measure by the first postulate the speed of light as the speed of light. So comparing the speed of light in both um, frames of reference, they are the same. B, compare qualitatively, so only the quality here, we do not need to determine any quantities, the time taken for the pulse to reach the sensor as measured by both observers. So let's have a look at X. Now let's do X, we're just gonna um, blot out what we see as Y, okay? In X's frame of reference, they think they are stationary. They don't know that the entire universe is going past them at 95C. So they think they're stationary and the world is going back in the opposite direction. So they think that the universe is going this direction at 95C. Okay, 0.95C obviously. Um, so in their frame of reference, um, they think they're stationary, therefore this will just take what they say is a normal time for it to happen. Okay. Now let's have a look at this uh, person out here. What do they see? Now don't worry about X. What they are seeing is they're seeing this sensor move forward. Remember, they, they're seeing the, um, the carriage move forward at a, um, a speed. So as this pulse goes this direction towards the sensor, then the actual sensor itself has moved forward. Okay, so the sensor um, is present approximately, let's just let's say the, present, the, the sensor is about there when the, um, the pulse hits it. Okay, so the pulse moves this direction, but by the time it moves to the sensor, the sensors move forward into this position and therefore um, the time taken to actually hit the sensor as observed by Y will be less, okay? So Y would observe a, um, the time taken for the pulse to reach the sensor as being less than what X would, okay? Remember X thinks that they are stationary and Y is moving back. So Y is the, um, the, the object in motion here because the light pulse is in the stationary um, frame of reference because X thinks they're stationary and it's Y that's moving. So Y observes length contraction. So that's what B is. So the time taken um, for the pulse um, for X would be longer than the time measured for Y. Y would see it at a shorter time because it's gone through a shorter distance. Okay. Um, this brings us to C, comparing the length the pulse would have to travel. Well, X sees it travel the entire carriage, but Y sees it only have to move this much here, okay, the foreshortened amount. Okay. And D, what fraction of its real length does Y measure the carriage of the train to be um, in which X is situated? Well, the fraction is given by the gamma fraction, a ga gamma um, factor. So let's work out the gamma factor for this situation. Okay. So the gamma factor for this situation is, um, so this is 8D. Um, the gamma for 0.95C would equal 1 minus 0.95 squared. And that's one over the square root of one minus 0 0.95 squared. 
and that's 3.2, okay? And that means um, the length at velocity would equal length zero over gamma. Um, so gamma would equal L naught over LV, which is 3.2. So the ratio of the proper length to the contracted length is 3.2, which means that the carriage, which is the proper length to the, um, so this is L naught, that's the carriage. So let's put that person there with the train wheels. Okay, and the observed length by the um, the observer who's seeing the, sh the full shortening, the person outside, um, they are seeing that the ratio is one to three point two. In other words, um, it's approximately um, this is three times bigger than this side here. Okay, so that would be the length of the carriage. So it'd be one third to um, to one. Okay. Um, so that's basically what um, what fraction it is. Uh, so you could say it's um, uh, 32 on, um, well, it's 3.2, okay? Three and two tenths or whatever. Okay, right here, let's um, uh, that will finish that one there. We'll move to another consolidation uh, sheet in the next video.